Welcome to the services of Glendale Presbyterian Church, located at 9218 State Highway 83 North in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday services at 11 a.m. Wednesday night services are the first and third Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. So it's great to be with you again. I think I checked the other day. I don't think I've been up here since last January. So it's been, it's been a long time. So I missed you, and it's good to be, be here with you again. So today, um, I'm going to read Matthew 1.1 1, 1, and going to speak on what I call Son of David, Son of Abraham. So if you can turn to your Bibles, if you need to, to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, you probably all remember what that says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So that's it. That's what we're going to talk about today. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that you by your spirit have called us to be here, that you by your spirit will teach us and instruct us, O Lord, that we, not that we would know more, but that we would love more. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I intend to, God willing, uh, to be here for the next three weeks, this week and the next two. And what I intend to do is I just finished a 15-week, last month I finished a 15-week class. So what I'm going to do is take 15 hours and I'm going to put it in three 30-minute segments. I hope they're 30 minutes. That's my goal. Anyway, but that's what we're going to do in the next three weeks. Um, I'm kind of a broken record. I've told you this before, but the, not that I'm a broken record, but what I'm going to tell you, I've told you before. The, uh, the, the genesis actually for that class came from the fact that I've told you years ago, handful of years ago, I taught a, a class on the parables. And, uh, that radically changed me. It, ra- uh, it, it, I was so deeply convicted reading those parables and going through and really understanding what was really being said in those and was terribly convicted. Uh, and, and really realize, I mean, every time I'd go through and do one of these, I'd say, okay, here's this group and here's this group and here's this group and here's, and, and quite honestly, if I'm honest with myself, which one of these little groups would I've been in? And I didn't always like the answer, but that after I got done with that class, I spent the next two years, just what I did is I read the gospels every day. I just went through the four gospels, just, just repetitively, uh, for, for two, uh, for two years, every, every day. And, and the thing that it, it, I was amazed at how much I thought how many of those stories I thought meant one thing and I realized how radically I had misunderstood exact, in fact, a lot of times just the reverse of what was being said. And I've actually come up here and preached some of the sermons I've preached as a result of seeing those stories differently than I had seen them originally. So that, that was uh, part of that. And I told you one of the things that always convicted me as I read these stories, as I read through the gospels is why these people were always drawn to Jesus and they aren't drawn to me, right? And so I've been on a quest to try to answer some of those questions and try to, to do better and to, in, in the sense of, of truly reflecting the, the love of God to the world in the way that God would have me and us to do that. And one of the things I will tell you as I start this and what I hope to be able to convince you of in the next three weeks is the gospel of Jesus Christ is so much larger than we've settled for. It is so much grander and larger and huger than what we have settled for. So if I, that's what I hope to be able to convince you because that's what I've become convinced of over the next three weeks. I'm afraid, you know, I, a lot of times I would look at myself and I think I look at some of us sometimes and I think, you know what, really all I'm doing is waiting to die. I thank God I get to go to heaven someday, but really all I'm doing now is just, okay, trying not to do too many bad things and, and you know, trying to stay out of trouble. Um, what we have here is so much greater than that. And it's so much bigger than that. And, and if we get that, I tell you what, we will fly out of the bed every morning because of the criticality and the importance of what we get to do. So that's just the background of what we're going to talk about in the next three weeks. You notice here he starts off with the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, we could spend weeks in this genealogy. We, we, that you want, you want to talk about interesting. You, you go through what Matthew's laid out here. We could spend, spend weeks doing that. We're not going to do that. In fact, I wasn't even going to mention the genealogy. I told myself, leave it alone and don't step in there. But I can't avoid the temptation. There's just, they're just, they're just, uh, it, it, this was their ancestry.com. This is the lineage. This is, this is the natural lineage God used to bring about his son, to bring his son into this world. And I got to tell you, this genealogy, if you don't, there's so many other things that prove this, but this genealogy should prove to you that man did not write this book. 
Man did not write this book. This, this genealogy is embarrassing. When you sit and look what's laid out here, uh, if, if you were trying to write a book about, you know, if you notice when somebody's going to run for president the year before, somebody goes and writes a book about Joe Blow and, and, and everything. And when you're wanting to convince everybody what a great man this guy is, you don't bring all the kooks and, 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 and the fruits and the nuts and the closet out. You don't. You just talk about, hey, he was the grand, great grandson of this great man and he was da da da. That's not what God does here. I mean, I'm sitting here, look, I, I'm look, what, Judah. I see Judah here. Judah, who has a, 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 a relationship, consorts with his daughter-in-law who is disguised as a prostitute. That's stories in here. There's adulterers in here. There's murderers in here. Manasseh's in here. Manasseh's probably the most wicked king that Israel ever had. Ruled for 54 years. Did everything he could to do everything Hezekiah had done. Someday I'm going to come up here and preach to you about Manasseh. Because it's an amazing story of the grace and mercy of God. But we don't have time to go down that path today. Four women are called out here. No Jewish book would have written about women. Would have talked about women. They, they, they weren't, you couldn't even accept their testimony in a court of law. Four of them are brought out here. Three of those four are Gentiles, and two of them are prostitutes. That's the kind of people that are in this list here. Only our supernatural God could bring about the salvation of the world through this muddled lot. Now, I don't know about you, but I take great comfort in realizing that God brings about his great purposes, not because of the people he chooses, but in spite of us. That comforts me. Matthew lays out here, Three fourteens. It's 14 generations from Abraham to David. It was 14 generations from David to the Babylonian captivity. It was 14 generations from the Babylonian captivity to Christ. But do you know three fourteens is six sevens? And what Matthew is telling us here is Jesus is the seventh seven. And any Jew knows that in the, at the end of the seventh seven comes the year of Jubilee. The slaves are free. All the debts are forgiven. The inheritance you lost because you squandered it is now brought back to you. What, what Matthew's telling us is here is Jesus is not only the Jubilee, Jesus is the Jubilee of Jubilees. That once all this is given back, it's never taken away again. That there, we're, there's not going to be another Jubilee because he is the Jubilee of Jubilees. That's all these things that Matthew has packed into these few verses he has here. But let's go back to verse 1. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's go to the setup. I've told you before at the highest level, if you want one sentence, and you say, Sam, what's this book about? And I'm quoting a guy I've read before. This book's about the guy that slays the dragon and gets the girl. That's what this whole story's about. This book is about the guy slaying the dragon and getting the girl. Okay? Now, you and I today are going to go one or two levels below that. In the... In the in, uh, Temples. We're going to talk about a lot about temples the next three weeks, but temples. Temples are the place where heaven and earth come together. It's the places where heaven and earth meet. Eden was a temple. God built Eden was a temple, and they were to make the entire earth a temple. It's the place where heaven and earth met. An ancient if you were to go into an ancient temple, you would go in, and if it was Diana or Aphrodite or whoever it was, there was a statue in there. There was an image in there of the God. And you know, God, when he built his temple, put his image in that temple. You and me, Adam and Eve. God put his image in that temple. One of the things, if you read liberal uh, historians or, or people, atheists or other people like that, they'll tell you that the, that the Hebrews were copying the ancients in the things that they were doing. Nothing could be further from the truth. The ancients were copying what was in the, the common psyche of man as a result of our common history and our common experience. Where, where did all the pagans go to worship their gods? They went up on top of a mountain. Why? Eden was on top of a mountain. When you go to see God, you go up the mountain. That, Israel didn't come up with that because of that. They came up with that because that's what was in our common history and our common understanding. When you went into these temples and you saw the images there, why was the image there? Because God put his image in his temple when he made that. Just an artifact of history that's interesting. In 63 B.C., when Pompey, the, the, the Roman general, came into the Jerusalem and he sacked Jerusalem and he went into the temple and he went into the Holy of Holies 
You know what he said about the Jews? They're atheists. You know why they were atheists? There was no image in there. He went into their temple and there was no image in there. They were atheists. He gave man a vocation. He said, you are my kings and priests. Adam, you are to take and turn the rest of this creation into what Eden is. You're to take and to expand and to tame it and to rule it and take the wisdom of God to the, to the rest of this and bring it into the cultivate like this garden. So you are to take this temple and make the entire earth the temple of God. You are to be my royal priest. You are to rule over it and you are to bring the praises of that creation. You are to take the wisdom of God, enforce it on creation, and bring the glories of that creation back to God. That was what his job was. That was what our job was that was given. God's plan has always been, from the very beginning, and we're going to come back to this over and over, but to rule his creation through his human image bearers. God's plan was always to live with his people, he lived and walked with Adam and Eve in the garden to live with his people and to rule his creation through his people. So we're going to follow these themes for the next three weeks, talking about this idea of a temple, talking about the fact of God ruling his creation uh, through those people. We immediately ran into the problem. The problem is man chose to worship the creation instead of the creator. When Paul in Romans 1 says that and begins talking about that, uh, first of all, Paul wrote that from, a feet, from Ephesus, not from Rome. But we out, sometimes, I think, get the idea that Paul's sitting here in the middle of a Roman society or the first century society and looking around and said, man, this is all really messed up. Here's how these people got here. That's not what he's doing. In the book of Romans, Paul's starting with this story right here and going, at, Adam and Eve began to worship the creature instead of the creator. And it caused all these problems. Idolatry is the fountainhead of every other sin. I've just recently come to realize that from reading the Bible over and over again. Idolatry is the fountainhead of every other sin. It's us worshiping something else other than God, and therefore all these other things happen. Sin. What is sin? I'm not asking for your, for, for your theological answer from your systematic theology class. Here's what I've come to realize sin is. Sin is anything that dehumanizes you. Sin is anything that dehumanizes you. God made you and I to be in his image, to be like him, to think his thoughts, to speak his words, to do his things. That's what God created you and I to do and to be. Now, all these, you and I can go get our Bibles out and we can come up with all these lists. Everything in those lists, the reason they're in those lists is because those make you not like God. They dehumanize you. And when you and I become dehumanized, we start dehumanizing others. That's why we have so much trouble getting along with each other. It's because we act like that. But sin is anything that dehumanizes. The reason that to me it's useful to think about it like that, what does Jesus do? Jesus gives you and I our humanity back. We begin to become human again in Jesus. That's what he does for us. I'm getting ahead of myself. The result of the sin was that the image of God was marred. Man lost his vocation as the royal priesthood. Instead of ruling, man now was enslaved by sin. The very things that we give into, the very things that we think. Why do you think Paul calls it the deceitfulness of lust? Because it promises something that it can never deliver. It promises what it can never deliver. And now man who was supposed to rule over all this is enslaved by the very things that he was to rule over. And it resulted in exile. Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. They no longer, God could no longer live in the presence with Adam and Eve. They were exiled and put out. Heaven and earth were no longer joined together. And God no longer lived in the presence of his people. And the rest of the Bible is the story of how God solves this problem. So that's the background. That's the setup. So what was the solution? Remember, we're talking about the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, God called a man named Abram, who later became Abraham, as a conduit through which all the world would be blessed. He would be the father of many nations. His offspring, the, the, his, his, the people in his tribe were going to be innumerable. The promise, though, um, and, and 
he also promised that his inheritance, he said, to Paul, uh, Abraham, look around you. The place where you're standing, you don't own one square inch. And your children, your offspring, your descendants are going to own as everything as far as you can see. So that's the promise God made to Abraham. Paul in the epistles revealed to us that Abraham's faith in God's promise was counted to him as righteousness. He also tells us, and this is the problem we have trouble getting, the idea we have trouble getting our head wrapped around sometimes, this promise wasn't made to Abraham's blood relatives. This pro promise was made to everyone who had the faith of Abraham. Paul makes that very clear. In, in Galatians and, and in Romans. And he promised the inheritance, the promise that he had made to Abraham, Paul makes it clear, was not just Palestine, but was the entire world. And he also tells us that that promise made to Abraham was not to be fulfilled through his seed, plural, but through his seed, singular. In other words, there was one coming, the son of Abraham, that these promises would be fulfilled through. Now God later chose one nation, Israel, descendants of Abraham, through which he would rescue and restore humanity. If I were to say to you, you are a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, you'd probably think, oh, that's what Peter said over in 1 Peter 2.9. That's what God said in Exodus 19.6 when they were standing by Mount Sinai. You, Israel, are a nation, a royal priesthood. So now that which man had lost through sin, God is beginning the process of restoring and he's picked this nation to be his royal priest to do that through. But what do you and I see as we read through the pages of the Old Testament here? This repetitive cycle of failure over and over and over again. Here's what you see in Israel. Vocation, he get, okay, here's your job. Here's what you're supposed to do. They fail. They're sent into exile. And then they're restored. And we start the cycle all over again. Over and over and over again. And what we see, if you'll remember, at the inauguration of the tabernacle in the wilderness, what happened? God took up residence. When they, when they inaugurated that, God's presence came in. Remember, the priests fell down. They couldn't minister. They just laid down with their face, uh, face on the ground because God came in and took up residence there. When Solomon dedicated his temple, God came and took up residence there. What we see in the, in the book of Ezekiel is finally God had had enough because of the idolatry over and over and over again by the nation of Israel. God finally left. So God, who had come to take up residence in this temple, Ezekiel in chapters 10 and 11 has a vision of God leaving the temple. And he's gone. And here's the thing that most people don't think about or realize. When, when they dedicated the second temple, the second temple was the one when they came back from Babylonian captivity. They rebuilt the temple. Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah built the wall, Ezra and those guys, and in the book of Haggai, they finally came in and they finished building the temple. God never took up residence in that temple, ever. You never see it saying, just like you did in the first two, that he came to do that. Although he did promise to one day, come and do that. God also promised that one day, one would come. So here's where we're starting to make the turn and go toward what Matthew's talking about at the beginning of his uh, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 here. David's son would come. We have a number of scriptures in the Old Testament that tell us that David's son would come to sit on David's throne and save his people from their oppressors and set all things right. The Old Testament also tells us that Yahweh himself, God himself said that he would come as king and rule over his people and over the world. He said that he would return to his temple and take up uh, residence with his people there. He tells us in Ezekiel 43, Ezekiel had a vision of God returning to that temple. In the book of Haggai, if you remember when they were rebuilding that, you still had the people that were old enough to, these are really old people, but they had seen the, old, the Solomon's temple before it had been torn down. And now they're seeing this thing that he's built here, that, that they built here when they've come back. And if you remember, the old, the old people were crying because of the difference in the glory of the old temple and the new one. And God said, don't cry. This temple will see far greater glory than that one ever did because someday the desire of all nations will come and the glory of God will fill this temple. And see, right now in the incarnation, in, in, in the advent and the incarnation, one of the things that we see that's exactly when Jesus himself showed up 
at that temple, that's exactly what they were talking about when they talked about that. When, G when God come to rule as king, the people's sins would be forgiven and they would be brought out of exile and be in exile no more. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why Jesus and John, why John was baptizing out in the Jordan River. That's what you do. That's, he was baptizing at the exact place that Joshua brought them into the promised land. When you've been out in exile in the wilderness, this is how you come back into the promised land. And that's why John was out there at the very spot that Joshua brought the children of Israel across. Baptizing there is because it signified that the new covenant is coming and the people are being brought out of exile and are in exile no more. You and I are in Advent. We just saw the candles lit today. Advent is a time of expectant waiting and preparation. Today is a wonderful, I was driving up here today, I was thinking this is a wonderful Advent day. It is. It's dark. It's gloomy. Right? That's what, that's what, it, it's incomprehensible to you and I today. I, 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 I've said so many times, I wish, and I think all of us would be so much better off if we could snap our fingers and go live in the pre-cross world for a day and then be able to come back here today. I believe you and I would be radically different if we could do that. See, you and I so live in the grace and the mercy in a world after the cross that, that we take it for granted. The world wasn't always like this. So Advent was the time that, of, of, of waiting and expectation. Israel as a nation, the, the, the faithful people of Israel as a nation. Ever since they come back from the Babylonian captivity, Israel had never been out of bondage. They never were self-ruled again. After they come back from Babylon, they always, first it was uh, one nation after the other that ruled over them and kept their foot on the back of their neck. They had no prophetic word or vision. Malachi was the last prophet that we had say anything that they accepted. So it's dark, it's quiet. We have, and, and, and think about how much worse that is when you're the people that have all these awesome promises. Think about you're reading through the Psalms and you're reading through the prophets. You're reading these wonderful things that God has promised for you someday. And, and you know these are mine. I get these. These are, he's coming. But yet you see the things year after year after year after year that we're living with and that we're going through. As I told you, God's presence has left Solomon's temple and has not returned. You know, realize when they came back from Babylon, they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore. Historically, we really don't know where it went. I mean, there's this theory and there's that theory. But when they came back, they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore. They didn't even really have a legitimate priesthood anymore. After the Maccabees and all the things that happened there with the Hasmonean Empire, uh, and, and by the time Jesus came along, the high priesthood, if you remember, in, in the Old Testament, the high priest comes and the high priest is chosen by God and he lives. And, and, and if you remember, there's big things that happen when the high priest dies. But he serves for life. In Jesus' day, it was a concession that was sold to the highest bidder. Remember, Caiaphas does it this year, and Anna, this guy does it the next year. And why? This is a very lucrative enterprise. And so now you have people paying for the privilege of getting to run the uh, economy of the temple over here. So they had a sham priesthood. The point I'm trying to point out to you was when Jesus came, it was dark. Judaism was not even recognizable anymore. The temple, when Jesus was walking around doing the things that he was doing, what was he doing? He was doing the kind of things that were supposed to happen at the temple. You get healed at the temple. You get forgiven at the temple. That's where you go over to do these things, and here's this guy walking around doing them all over the place. Why did, what, did, what did he do when he went to the temple? He got mad because the very place that's supposed to be doing these other things has became a place of economic oppression. These money changers in here, that you were, you, were, you were always going to be on the short end of that stick when you came in. You, you may as well not bring your lamb from Nazareth because they're not going to accept it. You got an inspector at the front door and he looks at, no, 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 no. That, that one don't work. You need to go buy one from this guy over here. Right? So, so you had that sham going on. At the same time, that's where all the records were kept, all the debts. So now you've got all these rich aristocrats, these high priests and these other people who are lording it over God's people, who are keeping them in subjection and oppression. That's why Jesus came in and kicked over the tables and was really, really upset about what was going on in there. I'll come back to the temple in a minute. But it was no longer the place of forgiveness and healing. It had become a place of economic oppression. So, with all that background, what was Matthew trying to tell us when he called Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David. 
Well, he's tipping his hand about what or where he's going to go for the rest of the book. Once you understand this, you realize what he's going to tell us the rest of the way. First, first, you got to remove some of the rubbish. I, I get the, the more I've read these uh, the gospels over and over again, the, the, the things that I was told most of my life about what here's what Martin, here's what the gospel writers were trying to tell you about. Okay, I'm not going to say these things. I'm going to tell you the things that I think are are not right. They're not wrong, but they're not they're not right enough. Okay, they're not wrong. They're not right enough. Jesus was a great teacher of morals and ethics. So, so we can look here and get the, the morals and ethics that Jesus is trying to teach. Now, Jesus was a great teacher. But don't even start down that. Now, so he goes along with, he's in there with Buddha, he's in there with Moses, he's in there with pick another, right? No, 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 no. The, 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 we aren't even in the same class to be having this conversation. I'll tell you what Jesus is teaching you. Jesus is coming to make a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. And he's inaugurating the kingdom of heaven. And he does, he says, here's how you live in my kingdom. When God rules as king, here's what it looks like. Here's how you act. You don't respond when, to, when somebody offends you. You forgive those. You, you, you love your enemy. You don't hate him. Not just your friends, but your enemies too. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. So, to say Jesus was a teacher of great morals and ethics, I'm not saying he didn't teach morals and ethics, but that totally misses the point. He was much greater than that. He wasn't just trying to teach you and I how to get to heaven when we die. I think that's one of the areas where we've kind of minimized the gospel. I'm not saying we don't go to heaven when we die. We do. Thank God for that. But that's not what this story's about. This story is so much bigger than you and me and you and me going to heaven when we die. We go to heaven when we die because of the rest of it. That's not the end all to be, be all to end all. It's, that's not what's being told here. It's not to prove that Jesus was God. That's probably the most common one I'd always say. See, the, the Gospels are proving to us that Jesus was God. Now, we do look at here and we say, Jesus is God. <laughs> but that's not the point. I, I saw an author one time, he said, that's about like a son who takes over his father's business and he spends his whole life trying to convince everybody he's the son instead of doing the business. Jesus is the son and Jesus is doing the business the writers of the gospel started the assumption that Jesus is God. Now what he's showing you is what it looks like when God is on earth doing things. It's a whole different focus. What was he telling us? He was telling us that Yahweh himself, in fulfillment of all the promises he's made, in the person of Jesus the Messiah, is becoming king of his people and of all the earth. He's showing you what it looks like when the will of God is done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus was doing, and that's what the gospel writers are trying to get across to us. That's why as you read, think about that as you read and now begin to look and see what he's doing. In the ways he, again, they're not trying to prove he's, he's God. They assume it. Jesus, in doing what he was doing, wasn't pointing to God. What he was doing was saying, this is what it looks like when God does things. In Mark 1, you start off right off the bat. And see, you say, well, where do you come up? How do you say if you go look at the scriptures that the writers of the Gospels use and then you go back in the Old Testament and see the, re the resonance that, that these scriptures come from, in other words, they're, they're quoting these scriptures, those are all the ones where Yahweh said he was going to come and be king. That's what they're quoting. And when Jesus is doing the things that he's doing, when he shows up and starts healing the blind and, and restoring limbs and raising the dead and forgiving sins and doing things like, those are God things. Now that's what got Jesus in trouble, right? Because the, the, the aristocracy of the day, the rulers, the, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, well, that's what God does. And he says, yes, he does. And, and Jesus, before he left, what did he say at the ascension? All power, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, based on that, you go do this. It's amazing to me how many of my Christian friends don't believe Jesus is in control and in charge today. Jesus is in control and in charge today. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go do. This, this, these are the kind of things we're going to talk about the next two weeks. We're going to unpack this a little bit. What, what was Matthew telling us with, with son of David and the son of Abraham coming? That the jubilee of all jubilees had come. Sin had once and for all been decisively dealt with. And that exile and death are conquered. 
We'll unpack that. The new temple through which God can now live among his people, it was always his intention to live among his people. Now, Jesus, when he was here, if you go to read the, uh, read the uh, Old Testament law of leprosy for a building, how does a, how does a building get leprosy? Don't ask me. I don't know. But they obviously can because it, here's what you do if a building gets leprosy. The priest comes in, you cleanse it, you go away, you come back. If it comes back, you cleanse it again, you go away, and you come back the third time, and if it's there again, you tear the building down. That was the law of leprosy. That is why Jesus cleansed the temple twice. And that's why Jesus came in the form of the Roman armies in 70 AD and tore the building down for good. Because it had, it was unclean, foul, dead. How could he do that? Because he is the temple. That's what the New Testament gospel writers are telling you. Jesus is the, is the new temple. Why? We don't need that building over there anymore. He heals out here because he doesn't need to be in there to do that. Jesus is the new temple. That's what the Gospels are telling you. That's why he says, destroy this temple in three days. Three days? It took 46 years to build that thing. You think in three days we could... He was talking about the temple of his body, right? So Jesus is the new temple, and that's part of what uh, uh, Matthew's telling us by Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. But not just Jesus is the new temple. Brothers and sisters, you and I are the new temple. He's the chief cornerstone, but we're rocks, we're bricks, we're stones built into this edifice of this cathedral of God, this temple of God that he's building in the earth. That's what the day of Pentecost was all about. Remember all the things, you know, the sounds and the the fire and all the rest of that? That's exactly what happened when God in the first tabernacle in Solomon's temple, when he come to take up residence, that's what it looked like. On the day of Pentecost, God was coming again to take up residence in his temple. You and I, the body of Christ. So Jesus and his body are now the temple. You don't need that building anymore. And he he was coming to proclaim that the new creation was here. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the new heaven and the new earth had begun. The new heaven and the new earth had begun. You and I live and a term that theologians like to use, the already and the not yet. All right? You say, wait a minute, you, you mean to tell, no, I'm not telling you that it, it, when it's all done, that this is all it's going to be. But I can tell you it's a lot better than it was, and I can tell you it's getting better all the time. And I can tell you that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, when the molecules of his dead body became alive again, he, he inaugurated, he ushered in the new heaven and the new earth and the new creation of which you and I are a piece and a part of, and we, like I said, we live in the already and the not yet. Let me tell you what I think too, too many of my Christian friends think like this. Paul on the road to Damascus. Now I'm going to say something here. Don't get upset with me. Paul on the road to Damascus. Many people look at, well, Paul became a Christian. I'm not saying he didn't become a Christian, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm nuancing the words here very carefully, okay? Paul never ceased being a Jew. You and I as Christians today, in a sense, never ceased being Jews. Christianity is the fulfillment, is the outgrowth, is the fullness of of Judaism. That was the shadow, we are the reality. What Paul realized on the road to Damascus was everything that he had ever believed was true. What what was a Pharisee in, in Paul's day? Pharisees believed everything I told you here today, that God was going to send one one day, and he was going to do all this stuff. And God was going to come and be king, and he was going to put righteousness and justice in place and get rid of oppression, and uh, he's going to do all those things. And Paul believed that. But the Pharisees believed that what's holding God back and keeping that from happening is his people aren't living faithfully. So the more faithfully we can live to the law, the sooner God will get around to coming back and doing all that stuff. When Paul got knocked off that donkey and looked in the face of Jesus and realized Everything I believed was right. My timing was all wrong. What I believed is going to happen has already happened. And that's what he preached the rest of his, go through his epistles. That's what he's saying. In the full, Jesus, through Jesus Christ, God has done all these things he said he was going to do. So many of my Christian friends today still are sitting here looking for something to happen in the future that has already happened in the past and that you and I should be entering into and living in now. Grasping, and, uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about for the next two weeks, kind of how you go about doing that.
But again, God now, through the new creation, is again restoring. You and I have gotten our vocation back. We're a royal priesthood. We now get to rule over his creation. And next week, I'm going to talk to you about what it looks like to be his people and how his people rule. To rule over his creation and be his image bearers. The earth today is being ruled from heaven by a man. When Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, for the first time in history, the earth was being ruled from heaven by a man. And we, his people today, are continuing to do his work to bring about the redemption of his creation. Jesus didn't just come to save your soul. He came to save your body. On that last day, he's going to tell your body to get up. And you and I are going to live in, 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 in these new bodies that are like his. But he didn't just come to save you and my soul body. He came to redeem the entire creation. And he intends to use his human image bearers, just like in the beginning, to do that and to bring that about. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next two weeks are those two things. Telling you everything that I've told you here today. You know what I understand now that I didn't get before? If you read, remember what I told you to begin with about I wondered why these people were drawn to Jesus, but they weren't me? I'll, t I'll tell you something. Every, when you read through the Gospels, every time Jesus shows up, a party breaks out. It did. He did. These, these people, these prostitutes and these tax collectors and these sinners and these people came. And a party broke out. And that's what all these spiritual uppity ups were all so much upset about. Because You know why? Because they, the things that we talked about here today, they understood that. They saw that. They realized that. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the new creation that you have made us. We thank you all that you've done in us and for us. And we pray and ask, oh God, that you would allow our hearts, our minds to see and to perceive and to understand and to live in the reality. In Jesus' name, amen.